Let me just begin by praying again. Oh, Father God, as we come into this time to really reset our hearts, reset our spirits, to fully connect with you, with the sacred, Lord. I pray that you would just help us all push aside all the thoughts of the week that has just passed. Push aside all the concerns of the week that is to come. Help us all, myself, help me fully connect with you in this moment, in this time, in this place. Help me enter into the sacred, God, to the holiness that is you. Help us all make that connection today. That's my prayer for all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we talked about relentless love, the relentless love of God. And we said, you know, he's calling us constantly to reset, to rediscover our first love for him, to respond to his relentless love for us in kind. And we used our God-given, sanctified imagination to kind of picture what would church in the world today look like if all we had to go on were just the writings of the Bible. We had no personal experience. We had no personal preferences. We had no anecdotes from others about what church is supposed to be like. We had no examples of other churches to glean from. All we knew was just church the way God defined church in the New Testament. That's it. We said, you know, it's safe to say resetting everything to God's original definition and model of church in the New Testament, that would be a major culture shift for pretty much every single church in America. And so what do I mean by reset? You know, sometimes your electronics, they get all gummed up with errors, and you've tried everything, and sometimes you just have to reboot them. That's the only thing that will reset them, especially if it's a Windows machine instead of a Mac. You have to reboot it to get it back on track. And sometimes even rebooting your electronics doesn't work. When things get really bad, you have to do what's called a reset to factory default settings. And so that's kind of the reset we're talking about in this series, hitting the reset button to reset us to factory default settings. And of course, our factory, our creator, our maker is the Lord God, right? So what did he really intend for us, both personally as well as corporately as Christians and as the church, as the body of Christ, the way our maker, our creator designed us and built us to function in the first place, a reset to factory default settings. So two of the key things we talked about last week were how the first church worshiped together daily in the temple. They were together daily in the temple worshiping. They were together daily sharing meals and prayer and fellowship and studying the teaching of the apostles from house to house. They really functioned as big ohanas, what we now call in the modern church, house churches. But back then they were just the church. That was the way they did it. Now we're like, oh, you know, we should rediscover these house churches thing. But that was their thing back then. So I didn't challenge all of us to worship together seven days a week, but I did ask all of us to just prayerfully consider adding Wednesday night worship to our worship schedules, to come together on a second day of the week for a large group fellowship and worship time. There are people in that service that you maybe have never even met before, people you've never talked to before. So it's a great fellowship opportunity in addition to worship. So we just said pray about it and do whatever God leads you to do. And that's true of every decision in life, isn't it? Pray about it and then do whatever God leads you to do. And I also challenged all of us to consider becoming part of an Aloha group. Again, not seven days a week like the first church did it, but just let's go one day a week. Could we get together house to house one day a week and do these same things that they were doing, living life together with other people for support, fellowship, Bible study, prayer. Uh, and we're talking two hours of corporate worship a week if we did both of these things and two hours of house to house, house churching, small grouping, aloha grouping uh, each week, four hours total of living life together as this local church. That's significantly less than the daily pattern of the first church, but it's an easy step in the right direction for us to rediscover the original passion and direction and excitement of our church as well. It's a great way to build unity and community here. So last week we talked about resetting to the beginning of WCC as well. And so the 25th anniversary history that Linda Harlow left for us has some great first person perspectives on WCC from the early days. Founders Frank and Kelly Ladwig wrote these words, the seeds for the church began at a praise and prayer group that met at our home. 
It started in a home church here, too, on a Hako place every week. We all wanted a church at Waikoloa that would be a beacon of God's true light in the community. This was our fervent hope and our constant prayer. And that same history also says that at the beginning of the church, quote, evolved from a weekly Sunday service held at the Waikoloa Village, Village Conference Room, followed by a weekly praise and prayer group that would meet in homes with three missions, to praise to pray and to laugh, featuring modern praise choruses and often sharing homemade skits, end quote. Isn't that a great original mission statement for those early Aloha groups? To praise, to pray, and to laugh. What if we all got together once a week in each other's homes to praise, to pray, and to laugh? Wouldn't that be amazing? And so I said, if you don't feel like you can do both of those things right now, your schedule is just too hectic, you can't do Wednesday night and Sunday morning and an Aloha group, then I said, just please choose an Aloha group. That's the lifeblood of the New Testament church. You'll be glad you did if you get involved in an Aloha group, doing life together as the body of Christ. And if all of us would do that, if we would all actively engage in an Aloha group, if we would treat each other like true extended family, it would have a profound effect on our future health and growth personally, but even more so as a church body, as we share love with each other, forgiveness with each other, grace with each other, mercy with each other, unity with each other, all of these things will abound. And so today, I want to talk a little bit more about worship, both private and corporate. And what I really want to talk about is this idea of connecting, resetting, rediscovering the sacred, the sacred. Here's a great quote by David Hunt, who's a Christian apologist. He, said, he defines worship this way. He says, worship is the heart poured out in gratitude and awe, expressing our appreciation of who he is and what he has done for us by his grace through Jesus Christ. So I want to begin by looking at a conversation that Jesus had with a Samaritan woman at the well. You probably know this story. They've already had a conversation about some sins in her life. And then this is her response after Jesus tells her things that she realizes only God himself could know. The woman said to him, sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. And you people say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem on a different mountain. And Jesus says to her, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You people worship what you do not know. We, the Jews, worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But a time is coming and now is here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such people to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and the people who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So Jesus says, you know, ultimately God doesn't really care which mountain you worship him on. He doesn't really care which place or which setting or even which worship style you worship him in. Those aren't important to him. Jesus says what God really cares about is that we worship him in spirit and in truth. He cares that our worship, both private worship and corporate worship, be a sacred experience. A sacred experience that unites us with him. An opportunity to commune with God. And in our modern world, with all our rushing about, we rarely take time for the sacred. In fact, we hardly ever hear the word sacred used in conversation in our modern world. But this word sacred is a synonym for holy or hallowed. And when we pray the Lord's Prayer, when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's the Greek word hagiazo. Hagiazo means sacred or holy or consecrated. And when we say that, we're acknowledging it's not only God himself, but even his very name is holy. It's hallowed. It's sacred. It's holy other than who we are. In Hebrew, it's the word kadosh. And kadosh carries the same meanings. There's a wonderful worship song written by a Messianic Jewish worship leader named Joshua Aaron. And in the chorus, he sings this. He says, Kadosh, Kadosh Ata, Ein Kamocha Adonai. Kadosh, Kadosh Ata, Ein Kamocha Adonai. Which means you are holy, holy. There is no one else like you, Lord. Oh, you you are sacred, Lord. Just pause for a moment and worship him for a moment. Think about what that means. You are holy, God. There is no one else 
like you. You are wholly other than all of us. Oh, come, let us adore him. It's not just for Christmas time, right? Oh, come, let us adore him. When I stop to realize that Jesus has given me the ability to speak directly to God, that I can converse directly with my creator, I am blown away every time. But I'll confess to you, I don't always stop to think about that. I get distracted in life. I sometimes find my mind going through the motions. That happens on Sunday mornings. There's so much going on here on Sunday mornings. It's so busy. So I'm thinking about the time. Are we running over? Did we start late? What's next in the order of worship? Who do I need to speak to before they leave? Who's waiting to speak to me? There's all these things that sort of keep my mind busy. And I find myself catching myself losing track of this great privilege of walking into the sacredness of God. And so when I catch myself doing that, catching myself getting off track, I realize I need to reset. Maybe that happens to you too. And so when I realize that, I just stop and I close my eyes, I take a deep breath, and I intentionally worship him in spirit and truth. So let's think about this carefully and intentionally. You and I are part of the body of Christ. Think about that for a minute. You are part of the sacred body of Christ. Let the mystery-filled reality of that statement just sink in deep for you this morning. You and I are joined together as the sacred body of the immortal creator God. And through the miracle of God's grace given to us through Jesus, we, though we are often very non-sacred people in our thoughts, in our actions, in our treatments of others, in our treatment of ourselves, we are joined as one body with the one who is holy, holy. And this time I mean W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy. He's holy, entirely holy. Sin cannot stand in God's presence. His complete holiness and justice must annihilate sin whenever it comes near to him. Now think about this. You know our sun is 93 million miles away from us. And yet we can't stare directly at it for more than a few seconds without damaging our eyes, right? We certainly can't get anywhere near it, let alone touch it, without being incinerated. And that's the way it is with sin and holiness. It's the same situation. And yet the Bible unveils this sacred mystery that Christ followers, the church, you and me, we are one with the one whose face is described in the Bible as shining even brighter than the sun. We are part of the body of the one Paul wrote about in 1 Timothy 6.16. He tells us that God alone is immortal and he dwells in unapproachable light. Unapproachable light. And yet we have been given an invitation to not only approach him safely, but to actually join and become one with him. We are now part of his body of unapproachable light. Because of Jesus, we can touch, we can become one with the Holy One and not die, but actually thrive. Think about that for a moment. Doesn't that give you pause? Just think about the mystery of that, the incredible gift that that is to us. Now, the problem is we've heard that kind of thing so long as Christians, so often, especially if we've been Christians a very long time, that there's a real tendency for us to kind of start to take that for granted, right? Right? To just kind of breeze by that truth whenever we read it in Scripture. We're part of the body of Christ. Yeah, 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 that's cool. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I get it. That's cool. No, it's way more than cool. Every time we fully consider that amazing truth, that appreciation of the sacred, we ought to feel stunned. We ought to feel overwhelmed. We ought to feel short of breath. Paul calls it a profound mystery. And yet often we don't act sufficiently mystified. I know I don't, at least I don't. And I'll confess, I'm sometimes guilty of this. With so many years of studying and preaching, I sometimes have a tendency to just kind of roll over things like this that I've read a hundred times before too quickly. I affirm it with my head knowledge without stopping, without focusing, without making time to make that mysterious, sacred connection. And I need to. I fail sometimes to be sufficiently impacted by the sacred. And maybe you do sometimes too. What if, 
What if we could reset? What if we could reconnect? What if we could rediscover the sacredness of God? I want to consider a vision of the sacred that Isaiah had in Isaiah 6. He writes these words. He says, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord. What a vision. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim, a certain kind of angel, a very high-ranking angel, stood above him, each having six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. Notice that here in the heavenly temple, in the throne room of God, even the high angels have to cover themselves from the glory of God, from the holiness of God. It's too much even for them to take full on. In his presence, look how these angels respond. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. What an amazing vision. In the presence of God, even the powerful, glorious angels respond in spontaneous worship with loud, resounding, passionate worship. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The vibration, only the sound of their voices, just the air pressure of their voices shook the door frames of the temple. Can you picture that? What if we worship so powerfully that it shook the door frames of our sanctuary? People in White Glove Village would go, was that an earthquake? And somebody would say, no, they're just worshiping down at WCC again. Can you imagine? What is Isaiah's response? Remember, he doesn't know Jesus yet. He hasn't been fully redeemed yet. What is his response to this vision of the sacred throne room in the heavenly temple? He said, woe is me, for I am ruined. Why does he say that? Because I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. What's going on? He grasped the full weight of the sacred, the holiness, the pure holiness of God, the absolute otherness of God. And he was shaken to the core. Prior to this, he might have felt like, hey, I'm a pretty good person. I'm a commendable person. I'm a person of good character. He was, after all, a prophet of God. But here, face to face with the sacred, he sees the truth. All of his goodness is insignificant compared to the perfect holiness and glory of the holy, sacred God. So he feels undone by comparison, ruined by comparison. He knows his sin deserves to be annihilated in the perfect holiness of God. So he refers to his own unclean lips the unclean lips of all of his people that he's been sent to reach with the word of God. He recognizes we're all contaminated by sin and therefore we cannot survive in the presence of our holy God. And so how does God respond to that? God responds by sending an angel who uses tongs to pick up a red hot coal from the altar. Notice that even this high angel, he's not able to physically grab a hold of and touch this coal. It's holy as well. It's sacred as well. So using these tongs, he flies it to Isaiah and he touches his unclean lips with it. He burns away the sin. And in doing so, the angel pronounces Isaiah's iniquity is taken away and your sin is forgiven. It's a clear Old Testament foreshadowing of Jesus. Jesus is the red hot coal on the altar of the throne room of God who comes and takes away our sin. So give Jesus glory in your spirit right now. Let's just pause for a moment for this amazing gift. We recognize and we confess our sin like Isaiah did. We affirm our need for his forgiveness. And Jesus burns our sin away. We should thank him a thousand times a day, every day like this. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So what if daily we can really take an introspective look at ourselves, recognize and confess all our own tendencies to drift back into sinfulness and our continual need to Jesus to burn it all away. What if we responded the way Isaiah did it? Overwhelmed with our connection to God, awestruck, humbled every time we encounter God in our lives. 
Notice also the whole temple in Isaiah's vision was filled with smoke. And when we put CIE, context is everything, when we put that into practice from the other sections of the Old Testament and from the book of Revelation in the New Testament, we learn that the smoke that fills the temple in Isaiah's vision and in John's vision and in other visions that are recorded in Scripture, that smoke represents the prayers, the worship, the adoration of God by the followers of God. This is those who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness, those who want to be holy the way he is holy. Look at John's vision of heaven and the throne room of God in Revelation 8. It's similar in some ways to Isaiah's. Another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer and much incense was given to him so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. See, when you and I pray with the rest of the body of Christ, our prayers rise to heaven like sweet-smelling incense, and they mix with the glory cloud of God. Isn't that an amazing thing to try to wrap your brain around? Our prayers go to heaven and mix with the glory of God. Our prayers matter profoundly. They feature prominently in the presence of God. Because of Jesus, we are part of the sacred. Look at another wonderful sacred mystery the Bible shares with us. This is in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. And we're told about an amazing thing that happened during the dedication of Solomon's temple for the Lord. So far we've looked at Isaiah's vision of the heavenly temple, John's vision of the heavenly temple. But now let's look at an actual physical temple on earth and what happened there. When Solomon had finished praying... Fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. The priests could not enter the house of the Lord, the temple, because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. All the sons of Israel, seeing the fire come down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground. And they worshipped and gave praise to the Lord, saying, Truly He is good. Truly His loving kindness is everlasting. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Right? You picture it? What must it have been like for the people there witnessing that at Solomon's temple? Fire. Literal fire coming down from heaven and the sacred, holy, perfect Shekinah glory of God filling the temple. How would you have responded? Would you have had a heart attack? Would you have hyperventilated? Would you have run away? Would you have fainted? Would you have responded in the way they did in this expression of expectant, all in worship, falling to the ground in humility, bowing before him, prostrate, right? They're there because they believed this would happen. They believed this was going to happen. God was going to show up in that day, and he did. A sacred, holy moment of complete worship. You know, the word we translate worship is really an incredible biblical word, both in Hebrew and in Greek. In Hebrew, the word is shakah. Shakah. Sounds a lot like our shaka, right? But with a more guttural sound, it's shakah. And it means, literally, to bow down. To fall down in worship, to stoop, to kneel, to crouch, to lie prostrate, to fully humble yourself, to show reverence. And then in Greek, it's the same idea, but it's the word proskuneo. Proskuneo, likewise, it means to crouch or to bow or to kneel or to show reverence to, but literally, it means to kiss toward something. Basically, to blow a kiss toward something. That's proskuneo. When we say, I'm going to worship the Lord, I'm going to blow kisses toward the Lord. Maybe you've seen in movies or TV where this Middle Eastern kind of culture is highlighted, and you'll see somebody kind of greeting somebody like this, that kind of thing. That's where it is. You're blowing kisses toward somebody else as you bow low in reverence and humility before them. Proskuneo. What an intimate, touching, personal, sacred picture. Blow a kiss. To God. I love you, God. Thank you, God. We read these amazing biblical accounts in the Old Testament where people were so overwhelmed by the sacred, they just couldn't help but respond in that kind of humility 
and adoration and worship. There are times they can't speak and there are times they can't stay quiet. They give themselves freely to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit leads them in their expressions and their experience of worship. And they just follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. You lead, we'll follow. And sometimes when I read those great stories, I don't know about you, but sometimes for me, I catch myself feeling a little sad that I wasn't there to see that kind of obvious physical demonstration of God's power and majesty and glory. I wish I would have been at Solomon's temple. I wish I would have seen the fire come down from heaven and burn up the sacrifice. I wish I would have seen the Shekinah glory of God fill the temple. It would make the majesty of our own Kilauea pale by comparison. I wish we still had those kinds of physical, visible demonstrations, those kinds of experiences with God. But then, I remember, I'm a part of an even greater demonstration of God's power and majesty and glory. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are too. Because we have been given this tendency to kind of forget that, to lose the plot, to misplace our connection to the sacred. And the good news is, all it requires is an intentional reset on our part. Reset to factory default settings. It requires us to drop everything else that's crowding out our connection, crowding out our appreciation of, our recognition of the sacred. And then, empty-handed, our hands are free to pick back up and hold closely the sacred moments and the things and the touch of God. Just pick back up the things God says. Hold on to these things. You don't need to hold on to any of those other things. Hold on to this. Look at what Paul shares with us in Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Now, before I read that, I just need to say, just prior to this, Paul has been talking about how we are dead in our trespasses. We were dead in our sins. We were walking according to the value systems of the world that were influenced by the devil. We were engaging in lusts of the flesh, desires of the flesh. And because of that, Paul says, we all deserved God's wrath. But because of God's great love for us, he says, because of his incredible mercy toward us, he provided a path to the heavenly places for us through the sacrifice of Jesus. And then he says, we are God's workmanship. We've been created in, in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance of our birth for each of us to accomplish. And Paul says, Jesus united Jews and Gentiles under one new covenant sealed in his blood. Through Jesus, Paul says, just prior to this passage, we now have access to God the Father through Jesus, guided by the Holy Spirit. So that's what he said right before the passage we're going to read. Now let's look at verses 19 through 22. He says, so then, basically another form of therefore, right? Because of all that other stuff I just told you, this is also true. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone of that foundation, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Don't miss this. Listen. Together with all the other believers, we are what Peter calls in 1 Peter 2, living stones. Living stones. And we're being built into a dwelling place of God. We're being built into the new temple of God. No longer a physical temple on earth, a spiritual temple in the heavenly places. And it's made up not of bricks and mortar, but of you and of me. We are the body of Christ. We are the temple of God. And when we worship enthusiastically, like the angels did in Isaiah's vision, because we're the living stones that make up the walls and the door frames of this temple, our temple is shaking too. When we're fully giving ourselves to the worship of the sacred one, this place is shaken as well. So think about this. As amazing as Solomon's temple was to look at, oh, something even more amazing happened. In the second chapter of Acts, when we as the church, as the body of Christ, came into being, when we were dedicated, look at the result of that event. We looked at the result last week. Let's look at the event itself today. 
When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. All these followers, about 120 of them. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves. And they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues or other languages as the Spirit was giving them Utterance. Just like fire fell upon the temple of God in Solomon's day, fire also fell upon the temple of God known as the body of Christ in Jerusalem when the church first formed. The fire of God fell on them. And we talked about what happened next last week. Full of the sacred, full of the Holy Spirit, full of the Spirit of God, they poured out into the streets and they boldly proclaimed the gospel to everyone. And you remember the result, 3,000 people got saved. 3,000 people became followers of Jesus that day. And then more people got saved and were added to their numbers every single day. Could a more miraculous response of God even be imagined? I mean, could you just imagine this kind of miraculous response to God followed by a great revival where new people got saved and became part of the church every single day? Could you imagine if that was happening in every local church all around the world today? It is happening in some parts of the world. In China, the world, the church is exploding with growth. In other third world countries, the church is exploding with growth. I'll share a little bit more about that with you next week. Miracles like that are what happen when we reset, when we readjust, when we refocus, when we restart, when we reconnect as often as we need to. Now, like I mentioned last week, we want to remember we are not a different church from the first church in Jerusalem. It's not that was a church and now we're a different church. We're the same church. We are one body of Christ. Every church all over the world, every time, every place, we're the same church. We all sprang from that little house church in Jerusalem. And we all grew out from there. When we became a follower of Jesus Christ, while we may not have seen the visible evidence of it that they did, the physical fire of the glory and holiness of God that fell on them, it also fell on us. It also filled us. It also burned away our sinful lips as well. But the longer we walk with Jesus, there's a tendency for us to begin to take all that for granted. And as we said last week, to begin to lose our first love to lose our first passion, to lose touch with the sacredness of God. And so God is calling to me constantly these days, calling me to reset every single area of my life, to respond in kind to his relentless love, to properly acknowledge and interact with and worship the one who is sacred. What about you? What about you? Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for your showing of the sacred to us in so many areas of life. We get so busy in our physical world that we lose track of the mystery and the sacredness of God. You're here in our midst at all times. We are part of you. You are part of us. We're one body, the body of Christ. We so often forget that. Help us really reconnect with you today to hit that reset button and to say it's important, it's crucially important for me to connect with the mystery of the sacred in every area, in every moment of my life. God, help me. Help me reconnect with the sacred today. That's a prayer of your heart today. We just say, me too, God. Me too.